Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. So we are on the last chapter of this book, The Matchless Gift. This is chapter 7 entitled Liberation in Krishna Consciousness. The sixth chapter we saw how Srila Prabhupada mentioned that if we take up sincerely to Krishna Consciousness, we can become, we can rise above material bodily designations and with that, we can rise above all kinds of material problems. Why we face problems? Because we are identifying with matter, right? And when we identify with matter and we work against Krishna, then there will be problems. So let's see what chapter 7 wants to teach us. Let us begin. If we simply worship the original person, Adi Purusham, we need not fear being misled by anyone. Sridhar Swami, the original commentator on Srimad Bhagavatam. So here Shla Prabhupada is quoting one of the Acharyas, early Acharyas. He's a 13th century uh, saint, right? Who came way, way before even Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's time. And uh, his name is Sridhar Swami. And he is one of the original commentators of Srimad Bhagavatam, who Chaitanya Mahaprabhu revered so much in all our Vaishnava Acharyas quote. So he explains that one can reach the perfection of life simply by devotional service. Kevalaya bhaktya. One need not dependent on any other process. Okay, there are so many other processes like you do tapasya, you do jnana, you may do some yoga, whatever it is. But just by devotion, one can achieve the perfection of life. Sukadev so Goswami says that one can put an end to material life by one stroke. Kevalaya. Like we discussed last time, Kevalaya means only. Keval means only. <coughs> there is no need to first undergo severe penances and, auster of, and austerity, practice celibacy, control the mind, the senses, give in charity, perform great sacrifices and become very truthful and clean. So these are all the prerequisites generally for a person advancing in spiritual life. First, practice this. First, do this. First, do that. But in bhakti, the first thing we do is devote yourself to Krishna. When you devote yourself to Krishna, all these other things automatically follow. There's no need for separately to endeavor to follow all these things. Simply by one stroke, by accepting Krishna consciousness, one immediately rises to the highest position. By just taking to Krishna conscious, one develops all transcendental qualifications. Prabhupada gives a beautiful example now. The goldsmith uses a small hammer and taps at the gold many times to shape it. Tick, 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 tick. But the blacksmith uses a large hammer and with one stroke, his job is finished. Isn't it? So Prabhupada says, this is the blacksmith's method. We are taking a big hammer of bhakti yoga and finish all material life. There is no need to undergo the many lesser disciplines, nor to follow any other process. In actuality, there is no possibility of even following the other Vedic process of perfection. So, you know, some people want to follow the other Vedic methods. First, do this yagya, then do that homa, then do this fasting, and do that upasana, do this nyasa. Nothing is going to work out. It's very difficult, right? take up to bhakti and to the degree that we're sincerely being Krishna conscious, automatically all these good qualities of sense control, cleanliness, truthfulness, austerities will come naturally. We would want to fast on Janmashtami because we want to please Krishna. We would want to follow Ekadasi because it pleases Krishna. Right? So, take up to Krishna conscious is a one-stroke method. The blacksmith's method, as Prabhupada says. For instance, the Hatha Yoga process, okay, the Ashtanga Yoga process, we would have to say you have to become a strict Brahmachari first and sit in the forest with your body at a right angle to the ground, straight, 90 degrees, pressing your nose with your finger for six months. Uh, who could follow such an instruction? Since such a method is not practical in this present age, the goldsmith method has to be discarded. The solution is to take to the blacksmith's hammer of Krishna consciousness and finish off all sinful reactions immediately. Beautiful line. By devotional service, one has to become Vasudeva Parayana, which means a devotee of Lord Vasudeva or Lord Krishna. In other words, we have to learn how to become lovers of Vasudeva. If the world takes up this Krishna consciousness, the planet is certain to be peaceful. Now, the earth is quickly becoming a hellish planet. 
And if this Krishna consciousness is not taken up, this hellish condition will progress despite all advances in education and economic development. This is a fact, you know, that despite so much uh, so-called material wealth that the world has today, so much technology, so much uh, development of cities and spaces and buildings, which we consider, we think it is development, but factually the world is more hellish. There are more heinous crimes committed. There are more sickly, demoniac conditions right, of people. Therefore, those who are thoughtful, those who are intelligent, those who have some brains, should take up to this movement very seriously and try to understand its value. It is not something manufactured by one man or a group of disciples. Please don't think, you know, the Prabhupada is writing about himself. It is not that I have and a few Western people have started this. No. It is authoritative and age-old, based on Vedic literatures which date back thousands of years. It's very bona fide. Niharam eva bhaskara. Bhaskara refers to the sun. The sun immediately dissipates mist or fog as well as darkness. As stated before, we should try to make the sun of Krishna rise within our hearts. In the Chaitanya Charitamrit, it is also stated that Krishna is like the sun. So we had seen this verse, I had shown to you before. Krishna Surya Sama, Maya Hoy Andakar, Jaha Krishna Taha Nehi Mayara Adhikar. Krishna is like the sun and that Maya, the illusionary energy is darkness. Jaha Krishna, wherever there is Krishna, Taha Nahi Mayara Adhikar. As soon as the sun of Krishna is present, the darkness of Maya immediately disappears. Without following this process, it is very difficult to overcome the ocean of darkness, Maya. If we simply teach people to surrender to Krishna, God, all the fog and mist of illusion will disappear. The method is very simple. Chant Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, 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 Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Therefore, we are asking everyone, please take this chanting seriously. Sometimes it's so simple that people don't want to do it. They want to do something complicated. But we tell people, please chant. The more you chant, the more purified you become. Chant very sincerely, clearly, so that the heart and the mind becomes clear and one can understand spiritual subject matters. The more one goes on chanting, the more the darkness of many lives is dissipated. Cheto dharpana marjanam. By chanting, one can cleanse the dust from the mirror of his mind and perceive things very distinctively. So when you meet someone new, you try to talk to them about Krishna consciousness, they cannot understand. Although it seems so basic, it seems so clear, but they cannot accept Krishna as God. Tell them to chant, chant, chant. The more a person chant, the more we keep chanting, dust does not accumulate. If not, even after practicing, if we stop chanting, again, dust will accumulate again and cover us again. <coughs> Thus, one will know what he is. Okay, If we chant nicely, we will come to clearly understand what we are. We are souls. We are not this body. What God is? What is this world? What is our relationship with God in this world? How to live in this world? And what our next life is? Such knowledge is not taught in schools where one is taught how to manufacture or acquire products for sense gratification. This is the teaching of modern science. If you take any degree, master's, PhD, it's all there. How to do sense gratification in XYZ, XYZ methods. There is always a hard struggle going on involving man's attempt to dominate material nature. However, for every convenience he manages to produce, there is an inconvenience accompanying it, isn't it? We saw this verse also I shared with you before from uh, Gulad Maharaj prayers. Dukkha You try to find a medicine to your dukkha, your suffering, but it creates more suffering. So for every convenience we are trying to create, we are just creating more inconveniences. People thought that if I have medical insurance, that's such a convenience. But the the amount of get back and the amount of you know uh, claims and this and it becomes more inconvenient. For example, recently some engineers designed an airplane which can fly at great speeds without danger. Brilliant. When the plane flies, however, it breaks all the windows over the city. Supersonic speeds. All the windows break. What's the point then? Our time is thus being wasted in constructing many devices 
which gives us temporary and artificial convenience at the price of proportionate amount of inconvenience. Beautiful line, right? One time Prabhupada was saying that a reporter asked Prabhupada, what do you think of the moon landing, America's moon landing incident? Of course, we know it's fake. So Prabhupada said, it's just a waste of time and energy. So much money, so much time you're wasted in going there. What are you going to get? What is the novel? What is the new? What is the niche in your life? Do you understand something better? It is, it is just pointless. What do you gain from it? Is the quality of life improved? Are you a better person? No. So, it's a beautiful line. Huh? Time is just being wasted in creating so many unnecessary things. Unnecessary, uh, what is this? Uh, needs. This is all part of the law of karma, the law of action and reaction. For whatever we do, there must be a reaction by which we become entangled. That is stated in Bhagavad Gita. Yagyartha karmano nyatra loko yam karma bandhana tat artam karma kaunteya mukta sangha samachara. An important verse in Bhagavad Gita, third chapter, ninth verse. Work done as a sacrifice for Vishnu. Work done to please Krishna, has to be performed. Otherwise, whatever work we do, if we do not offer it to Krishna, it binds one to this material world. Yajnartat karmano, work only for Krishna. Anyatra, otherwise, lokoyam karma bandana, your work will bind you to this world. Okay? Therefore, O son of Kunti, perform your prescribed duties for his satisfaction. And in that way, you will always remain unattached and free from bondage. This is a secret. How to be free from karma? How to escape karma? Not by stopping work. You cannot stop work. Do your work, but for the pleasure, tat artam, for his pleasure, for God's satisfaction. When one acts for sense gratification, work entangles him. Whether the work good, be it good or bad. But if one works for Krishna, yajnar tat karmanu, he will be free regardless of the possible desirability of his work. Not only does Sukadev Goswami recommend unalloyed devotional service, but he further says that by devotional service, one's sinful activities will be negated. Every one of us is more or less sinful, for if we were not sinful, we would not have been put into material bodies. Right? The beautiful line again. Some people say, no, I'm such a nice person. I've never done anything wrong in my life. Nonsense. The very fact that we have this material body, this material life is a receipt. This material body is a receipt. You buy something, you get a receipt. Proof of purchase. This material body is a proof of our sin. Right? As soon as one is free from sinful life, he is liberated and transferred to the spiritual world in the spiritual body. The whole process is to cleanse oneself from the contamination of sinful or material life. Sukadev Goswami said, My dear king, those who are sinful can become purified from contamination by tapa adibi, practicing austerity, and so forth. Sukadeva also said, however, that no one can become completely purified by executing this process of austerity. Austerity is if you do only austerities, not Krishna conscious austerities like Janmastami, Ekadasi, but in general austerities which people do by fasting for this and that, so other reasons. You can become purified of some sins but not completely purified. There are many examples of yogis who practice austerities but did not emerge completely pure. So here Prabhupada gives the example of Vishwamitra Muni. For example, was a Kshatriya who wanted to become a Brahmana. So the story is that Vishwamitra Muni, before that, he was actually King Kaushika. And uh, he was born a Kshatriya, but he had Brahminical tendencies. This was because of his mother and his grandmother at the time who was given a special kir to honor. And the mother was given a kir to born a uh, Kshatriya child. And the grandmother was given a kir to born a Brahmana child, but they changed it. So the mother born a child of a Kshatriya with a Brahmana nature. That is the Kaushika. So one time this Kaushik Rishi, uh, sorry, Kaushik Raja, king, he, he went and saw Vashishta Rishi. And Vashishta Rishi had a Kama Denu cow. And he became so attracted to it, he tried to steal the cow from Vashishta. But Vashishta used his mystic opinion. Although he was staying in a small hut, he uses his mystic powers and he defeated the king and all his soldiers. So Kaushik king was so shocked. He said, what is this? He said, this is Brahma Tejas. This is the power of being a Brahmana. So immediately, Kaushik, he became desirable. I also want to be a Brahmana. I want to be a, you know, Brahma Rishi. 
and he did tapasya and he became Vishwamitra. So here's Vishwamitra, powerful person, right? The stories are all mentioned in Mahabharata Ramayana. Later on, however, he became a victim of Menaka. So he did so much tapasya to elevate himself from a Kshatriya to a Brahmana, to get Brahmana Shakti, Brahmana Tejas, right? But later when Menaka came and danced in front of him, broke his austerity, a society girl of the heavenly planets. Because Vishwamitra was not pure, he became entangled with her and begot a child, Renuka. Therefore, it is said that even if one performs austerities and penances, worldly circumstances are so implicating that somehow or other they will involve one again and again into the modes of material nature. So many people have been throughout their lives, you know, before Krishna conscious, doing a lot of fasting, doing a lot of worship of different devas and different kinds of austerities and whatnot. But all that can just bring you up to some level, right? Krishna consciousness, austerities in Krishna consciousness, be it as simple as an ekadasi or janmastami, is so powerful to destroy sinful tendencies even. There are many examples of sannyasis who give up this world, huh? renouncing it as false, saying, let me turn to Brahman, let me turn to spiritual bus. But they again come entangled in the work of the world when they set up hospitals and perform philanthropic work. So there are so many famous uh, so-called gurus and yogis and munis and whatnot, babas. and So they uh, renounce this world, saying this world false. But later they open up so-and-so foundation, right? So-and-so NGO, they open up, they open up a hospital, they open up a school, they open up. If they're saying this world is false, then why do they come back doing philanthropic work and welfare activities? If it is false, why are they attracted to welfare activities? The philosophy of Krishna consciousness maintains, now what is our stand on this? That this world is not false, but it is temporary. The world is not fake. It's not false, but it's temporary. God created this world and he is true. So how can his creation be false? Because this is a creation of God and God is absolute truth. The creation is also true. We simply see it otherwise due to illusion. The world is a fact, but a temporary fact. A person may claim something within this world to be his property, but that is a false claim. Like nowadays I see many places, people buy land, they put a big signboard. This land belongs to so and so. And I'm thinking, you just purchased it now, you know, a few hundred years ago, someone else was claiming the land. Tomorrow you're dead, you're gone. Your people sell the land, someone else will come. Land is always there. People are striking claim to it. Yeah, it's very foolish, false claim. It is a fact that it is someone's property. Who is that someone? It is God's property. Isha Vasyam Idam Sarvam. This does not mean, however, that the property is false. What is false is the claim to the property. The property does belong to someone. That is God. Which is based upon a puffed up false consciousness that the individual is the proprietor, the master or God. Everyone desires to be the master or proprietor of something. Then minister, then president and then God. The condition, nature of the condition, so is we always want to own something, control something. Prabhupada always says, no, if you have nothing, people won't have children so they can control. And they, when some people don't have children, they cannot control. They keep a dog, they try to control. Or they keep a guinea pig, a small something, they try to control, right? Or someone keeps a big television and take the remote control. I am the controller. <laughs> someone wants to control something. When everything else fails, the living entity wants to become God. The tendency is that the tendency is there to want to become the greatest of all. But the fact remains that God is the greatest and the living entity is small compared to him. The smallest is not false and the greatest is not false. But when the small thinks that he is great, that is false. Beautiful. Another beautiful line. We are true. God is true. But when we think we, are try to, we want to become God, that is fake. We understand from Vedic literature that Brahman or the spirit is anor aniyamsam, smaller than the atom, mahato mahiyamsam, greater than the greatest. As far as we can conceive, the space which contains the universe is the greatest, the whole expanse of the universe. But Krishna has shown millions of universes in his mouth. So the greatness of God cannot be comprehended by the living entities who are part and parcel of God. Uh, this is a statement which is which people who follow the Bible, who follow the Quran, they also agree. 
right? Because we are part of God, we cannot over, we cannot understand God. So they, the why they say then they say like that that okay that means God does not have a form because you cannot comprehend him. But that is wrong. We see or we understand the form of Krishna, but within that form of Krishna, which we know is unlimited, but which we are seeing as limited, which is wrong, it's not true. God's form is unlimited. But within that form of the Lord, which looks limited, there's unlimited universes. How is that possible? So God has a personality, but it's a transcendental personality, transcendental form. Just because you look at it such a way does not mean that that is it. Right? So the people of the Abrahamic religion, they deny. They say God cannot be comprehended. Therefore, God has no form. This is wrong. God cannot be comprehended. Yes, he has a form, but his form is divyam, which is inconceivable. Not like ours. As living entities, we are very minute, infinite decimal, and God is infinite. Indeed, the magnitude of the individual spirit soul is so microscopic that it cannot be seen. One cannot even imagine it with his material senses. Therefore, it is said that the spirit soul is smaller than an atom. Anur aniyam sam. Since the living entities and Krishna, the Supreme Lord, are both spirit, right? we are very small, God is very great, but both are spirit, they are qualitatively one. Quantitatively, however, the Lord is great and the living entities are small. This fact can, this fact can be accepted immediately on the basis of Vedic information. In Brahma Samhita, it is stated, Many millions of universe comes out of the bo God's body when he exhales. In one exhalation of the Lord, so many millions of universes comes out. And within that universe, there are planets. Within those planets, there are cities. Within those cities and countries, there are small jivas living. And they again disappear when he inhales. Simply by his breathing, millions of universes are created and dissolved. If this is the case, then how can the living entities claim proprietorship over anything? Uh, you claim over something, God, one inhalation and exhalation. Katam, finish. <laughs> Whatever you claim is yours is gone. One's position is safe only in so far as he does not falsely declare himself to be God or proprietor. That is a safe position. That is who we are. It has become fashionable to claim to be God. And fools accept such claims. So many people now just wanting fame, just wanting popularity. They want attention. They feel that. So they claim that I'm God. And they make a huge uh, propaganda out of it. But from the Vedic literature, we understand that God is not so cheap. As long as we are not making puffed up egocentric claims, we are really liberated. Real liberation means, liberation means that we humbly accept that we are servants of the God. There is no need to actually seek liberation. Prabhupada saying liberation is natural. There's no need to look for it. Just stop being egocentric and thinking that the world revolves around us. But as long as one thinks, I am this body, he is not liberated. Liberation means knowing perfectly well that one's self is separate from the body. Therefore, Sukadev Goswami said, Prayas Chittam Vimarshanam. Develop your knowledge. That will give you relief. Our knowledge is perfect when we come to know that we are very small particles of spiritual sparks and that God, the supreme, the greatest spiritual identity, supplies all our necessities. Eko bahunam yo vidadhati kaman. By knowing ourselves as minute particles, part and parcel of God, we can understand that our duty is to serve God. God is the center of all creation, of the whole universal body. He is the enjoyer and we are his servitors. As this conception becomes clear, we become liberated. So when someone asks what is real, real liberation? Liberation means Swarupena Vyavastiti. Mukti Hitva Anyata Rupam Swarupena Vyavastiti. What is Mukti? What is liberation? It means that when one gives up all other false notions and one becomes situated in one's original constitutional position as a Das, as a servant of God, that is actually considered liberated. Liberation entrails freedom from all false conceptions. It is not that upon liberation one acquires ten hands. Right? People say, liberated, so where is my ten harm form? Not like that. 
in Srimad Bhagavatam, liberation is defined as muktir hitva anyata rupam. Mukti means to give up. Anyata rupam, other denote, uh, denotes a false conception of life. That is to say that when one is situated in his original constitutional position, having given up false notion, he is liberated. It is also said in Srimad Bhagavatam that by acquisition of knowledge, one becomes liberated immediately. That knowledge can be very easily acquired. For it, it is simple. Simple, Prabhupada is making it very simple right now. God is great, I am very small. He is the supreme proprietor supplying all necessities and I am his servant. Who can challenge this? It is a fact. So this is something that we should always constantly remember when things go wrong in my life and I try to blame or change circumstance. That means I'm trying to be a controller. But when things go wrong, things go right, when we accept that is the will of the Lord, my Lord, what you're trying to teach me, let me understand, let me come closer to you. That means we're a servant. But when we fight against our condition and we complain and we argue and we crib or when we become very sulky or sad, that means we are trying, subtly we are trying to be, we're trying to control or trying to change things. Isn't it? We are simply under the false impression that we are this or that. And these leads us to ultimate false impression that we are God. Yet we do not consider what manner of God we are. A small body disorder will send us to the physician. Small pain we run. Isn't it? Then what kind of big controller, big enjoyer? Who are we? Nothing. We cannot enjoy anything in this world. We cannot control anything in this world. We cannot own anything in this world. CEO. Controller, enjoyer, owner. These are all CEO is Krishna only, not us. One who claims to be the supreme, therefore, should be understood to have fallen into the last snare, catch of Maya. One who is thus fallen cannot even be liberated, for he is bound by false impressions. So sometimes the material situation engulfs a person so much. The person just thinks how to improve my situation. Oh, I need money. I have so much loans. Oh, that person doesn't like me. Oh, I've lost this person. I need to this. I need to that. So much we are um, caught up by the material flow of relations, family, money, and so on and so forth that we don't actually have time for Krishna. One has to accept the situation and move on. But sometimes we become so caught up, right? Because the nature of this world is it keeps moving. It keep, it's not going to stop for anyone, right? You will meet people, you will lose people. Get over it. You will earn money, you will lose money. Get over it. You will gain something, you will lose something. Get over it. To the degree that we are hung up on things, that means we are trying to be the controller. Only when one has attained proper knowledge can he actually be liberated. The stage of liberation is also called Brahma Bhuta stage. One who has attained this stage is categorized by Sri Krishna and Bhagavad Gita in this way. Brahma Bhuta Prasannatma Naso Chati Nakkang Shati Sama Sarvesu Bhuteshu Madbhaktim Labate Param What is the liberated stage? One who is thus transcendently situated at once realizes the Supreme Brahman. Right? One who is actually liberated. He never laments. That means never cries over small things. We analyze our own lives. Every moment we are just complaining, cribbing, arguing. Comparing, criticizing, you know, something. Because that's our nature. Nor does he desire to have anything. So if we are not doing all that cribbing and complaining, we are simply loathing and desiring and greeding over things. I want this, I want that, I should have this. We we hear friends say that, oh, I just went to America and came back. Oh, I also want to go to America one day. So all this desiring and this and that. He is equally disposed to every living entity. And in that state, he achieves pure devotional service unto me. Right? The joy which follows realization arises from understanding. I was illusioned by false notions for so long. What a fool I was. I was thinking that I was God. But now I can understand that I am God's eternal servant. Upon gaining such realization, one, under one attains liberation and becomes prasannatma or jolly. So this is the constitutional position of the living entity. It's actually real happiness. When one gives up this notion of controlling, enjoying, owning, forget about it. Right? There is no lamentation when one is in pure consciousness. For he knows that he is a small part, a spiritual spark, protected by the Supreme Lord. 
when there is when then is there a scope for lamentation right so for a devotee he knows that anything good anything bad comes in my life ultimately god is the protector why to get hung up about it why to get so much hurt or worried about it when you lose someone you understand this is the way the world works but there are people even after 20 30 years they cannot get closure they cannot overcome their emotions you know that oh i've lost this person today you lost that person tomorrow you're going to lose yourself right this is the way how the nature of the world works so when we are stuck with so much trying to be the enjoyer and the control and the owner we will always lament a small child feels free as long as he knows that the father is there if you see small children with their parent they are so happy they run around they are little you know carefree he thinks that my father is standing by me so i am free no one can harm me similarly when one surrenders to krishna he is complete faith that he is not in danger because krishna is protecting him now how krishna protects that can be you know krishna may protect us by giving us cancer that is protect our consciousness the body may be destroyed but we you know we may become better devotees so how krishna protect does not mean the way i want the way krishna protects right but we can rest assured that god is always there whatever happens has to happen that's fine not a big thing krishna is the supreme controller krishna is the owner and master of everything i am his servant one has this consciousness one will never lament or argue or complain about one situation one who is thus surrendered to krishna is not subject to lamentation or desires whereas one who is not god conscious simply hankers and laments oh i did not get this job oh i did not get that money oh i have not visited this place why people visit places because they want to enjoy they think that by going here and there i can have more enjoyment better enjoyment but after going and coming they realize it's all the same anywhere <laughs> right he hankers for that which he does not possess and he laments for that which he did possess but has lost right that is hankering and lamenting a god conscious person thinks a god conscious person is not subject to such misery if something is lost he knows that it is god's wish and he thinks god desired this so it is all right he does not desire for anything he knows that all his necessities are being provided by krishna the supreme father so for a devotee if we lose something we're like oops okay i never had it before i had it for some time i didn't have it now again fine what can be done krishna is the supreme control leave it move on right there are more important things to think about as soon as one understands his relationship with god he realizes universal brotherhood for he understands that all men and animals indeed all life itself beautiful point our parts are all parts of the supreme whole and are therefore all equal seeing this one does not envy exploit or trouble another living entity right so here comes the question of meat eating when one kills cuts another animal it's because of envy how is it envy i will live you cannot live right for me to live you must die that is envy exploit one does not need to eat that animal to live but still you say no 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 let me kill you and eat you exploit and trouble unnecessary trouble unnecessary you're killing another animal right thus one who is a devotee of krishna automatically develops all good qualities for he is in the proper consciousness harau abaktasya kuto mahat guna manorate nasati dhavatu bahi this verse also we had seen in our previous readings we had gone in depth about this prahlad maharaj prayers right if one who is not a devotee harau abaktasya kuto mahat guna what good qualities he can have whatever seemingly good qualities are simply just based on his mental state mano ratena asati bhavatu you cannot trust it it's just floating on the chariot of the mind right you cannot trust such good qualities one who has developed krishna consciousness will manifest all the good qualities of the demigods indeed it is stated vancha vancha kalpataru bhyascha kripa sindhu vya evacha a vaishnava or a devotee of krishna is an ocean of mercy to others he gives the greatest gift of society for society is in dire need of krishna consciousness a vaishnava bestows the priceless gift of the maha mantra hare krishna hare krishna 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 hare 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 rama hare rama 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 hare hare simply by chanting this mantra one can remain in a liberated state now one should not think however 
that this state of liberation is simply a state of trance whereby one remains seated in a lotus position in a corner for days on end. Some people think liberation means nothing. White room, empty, sitting down quietly. No. Liberation means serving. Liberation means seva. Mukti means seva. One cannot simply say, now I have dedicated my life to Krishna. Let me remain seated in Samadhi. Now I am a devotee of Krishna. Let me do nothing. Not like that. The standard of surrender must be maintained by Nishevaya, serving. So how do you actually know someone is a devotee? They are very eager to serve. They want to come to the temple. They want to decorate the Lord. They want to cook for the Lord. They want to invite others. They want to tell others about God. This service attitude is what makes a person a devotee. As one serves the Supreme Lord and the Lord reveals himself within the heart. The program of devotional service to the Lord is executed from morning to night. That is devotional service. Indeed, Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita that one must engage in devotional service to him 24 hours a day. So, you know, waking up thinking of Krishna, moving thinking of Krishna, bathing thinking of Krishna, eating thinking of Krishna, drinking thinking of Krishna, sleeping thinking of Krishna, dreaming thinking of Krishna. It is not that we should meditate for 15 minutes and then engage in all kinds of nonsense. This is what people usually do. They wake up in the morning, go to the temple, light some incense, ring some bell, okay, okay, then whole day nonsense, drinking this, eating that, reading this, doing that, nonsense. Right? The more we serve, the more dedicated to Krishna we become. Therefore, a person should utilize whatever talents he has for Krishna. Whatever you have, whatever ability. You have a house, make it a home of Krishna. Build a big altar. Why put the TV there? Build a big altar. Cook. If you have money, make nice prasadam, distribute it, uh, offer it to Krishna. There are nine processes of devotional service. Hearing, chanting, remembering, serving, worshipping the deity in the temple, praying, carrying out orders, serving the Lord as a friend and sacrificing everything for him. This is the Navavida Bhakti. Nine uh, types of devotional service. Shravanam, Kirtanam, Smaranam, all right, uh, Archanam, Vandanam, Hasyam, and different, different things like that. One should always keep engaged in at least one out of the nine processes. Something you should always keep doing. What is possible? One who is always engaged in Krishna's service never becomes disgusted. Bajatam priti purvakam. Right? Service must be rendered with love. But in the beginning, this may be difficult. And so, one may become disgusted. One may become a little lazy, tired, irritated, frustrated. As one makes progress in Krishna's service, however, he will find it pleasing. This is indicated by Krishna in Bhagavad Gita. Yet that agre visham eva, that which in the beginning agre is like poison, visham. Pariname amrito upamam, but later it transforms into amritam, nectar. That sukam satvikam proktam, that kind of a happiness is called satviki happiness. Atma buddhi prasadajam, that which pleases the mind, pleases the senses, pleases the intelligence, that is satvik sukh. What initially seems difficult, but later it's very nectarine. That which in the beginning may be just like poison, but at the end is like nectar, which awakens one to self-realization, is said to be the happiness in the mode of goodness. So if you can check out this verse, see the 38th, 39th verse, happiness in the mode of passion, right? Which beginning seems very nice, end is very horrible. Or passion or, or happiness in the mode of ignorance. Beginning is poison, end is also poison. Right, you can see that those verses. Once one has attained the spiritual platform, it is material service that actually becomes disgusting. Okay, one who actually has taste for Krishna consciousness, material engagement seems disgusting. For example, if one chants Hare Krishna throughout his life, he will not grow try tired of the names. But if one chants a material name over and over, like proper jokes. Pepsi, 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 Pepsi. You will get, you know, you will get tired. He will soon become disgusted. The more one chants the name of Krishna, the more he becomes attached. Thus, service by Shravanam and Kirtanam, hearing and chanting about Krishna, is the beginning. Actually, out of the nine limbs, these two are the king limbs, hearing and chanting, because these are things which you can do unlimitedly. There is no limit to it. There is no limit to chanting. There is no limit to hearing. The ears don't have a uh, you know, a limitation. You can unlimitedly hear. 24 hours a day, you can continuously hear. You can continuously chant. 
there's no saturation to it. Other processes, you may find some limit. Like I can offer prayers or worship to the deity for some time. I cannot do 24 hours, a whole night do deity worship. But Shravanam and Kirtanam is something you can do anywhere, anytime, unlimitedly. There's no saturation point for it. The next processes is Smaranam, always remembering Krishna. When one is perfect in chanting and hearing, when one is good in Shravanam, Kirtanam, he will always remember Krishna. Smaranam is a natural product. In this third stage, he becomes the greatest yogi. Because one who always remembers Krishna is the greatest yogi. Satatam Kirtayantomam. Krishna says in the end of the sixth chapter of Bhagavad Gita, who is the greatest yogi? Satatam Kirtayantomam. One who is always worshipping and glorifying him. Nor is progress in Krishna conscious ever lost. In the material world, if one begins to construct a factory but does not complete it, the factory is useless for all intents and purposes. If the construction is stopped and the building half finished, whatever money is invested is lost. Right? This is not the case with Krishna consciousness. For even if one does not come to the perfectional point, whatever work he does is his permanent asset. And he can begin from that point in his next life. Krishna also confirms in Bhagavad Gita that one who begins Krishna consciousness cannot lose anything. The beautiful verse comes. The eternality of bhakti. Neha vikramana shosti pratyavayo na vidyate svalpamapiyasya dharmasya trayate mahato bayat. In this endeavor, there is no loss or diminution and a little advancement on this path can protect one from the most dangerous type of fear. In the sixth chapter of Bhagavad Gita, when Arjun asks about the fate of the unsuccessful yogi, right? So in the sixth chapter of Bhagavad Gita, Arjuna gets a question. He says that, Krishna, you know, what if I endeavor so much and then I don't complete it? What will happen to me? I'm neither here, neither there. I reject this world. I become so spiritual, but I cannot complete it. So I'm not in this world. I'm not in the next. Where am I? I'm like a riven cloud. Have you seen sometimes a cloud that's moving towards the sky and suddenly a huge gush of wind comes and part of the cloud gets torn off. It's called a riven cloud. Torn in the cloud. Small part comes riven off. And as it floats, 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 the sun, um, you know, uh, dissipates on it and the cloud kind of vanishes. That small portion, riven cloud, destroys and disappears. So Arjuna is feeling, I'm like that. I've given up society and I've taken spiritual life, but if I can't do it, then I'm nowhere. I'm neither here, neither there. So Arjuna answers, uh, Krishna answers, Partha naiveha namutra vinashastasya vidyate nahi kalyana krit kaschit durgatim tata gachati. O son of Prata, a transcendentalist engaged in auspicious activities does not meet with destruction either in this world or in the spiritual world. One who does good, my friend, Kalyanakrit, is never overcome by evil. So here Krishna is telling Arjuna that whatever you did is an eternal benefit in bhakti. The Lord then indicates that the unsuccessful yogi takes up his practice of Krishna conscious in the next life. The very next verse Prabhupada is saying, Krishna says that, uh, Suchinam Srimatam Gehe Yoga Brashta Vijayate. So someone who is a yoga brashta, <coughs> meaning one who unsuccessfully cannot complete their bhakti. No problem. Next life, you will born in a suchi naam, a suchi house, house of people who have high character, high, uh, or shrimatam, rich house. Right? So that means you get all facilities to continue. You're born in a good family. You're born in a rich aristocratic family. So you can continue. Beginning from the point of where he left off. In other words, if one has finished 50% of the process in one life, in the next life, he begins at 51% automatically. So see how great, powerful and important is Bhakti. Uh, unfortunately, people may not complete 100% in this life. Of course, we want to. They can if they want. But if they don't, still does not matter. Whatever little they have done will continue in the next life. Whatever material assets we accumulate in our life, however, all are annihilated at death. Isn't it? Whatever you have amassed, suddenly a person gets a heart attack and dies. You have to you know, settle all the properties, settle all the debts, settle all the bank balance. So everything they leave behind for others to settle. For we cannot take material opulence with us. However, one should not think that he will do well to wait for the next life to attain Krishna consciousness. Some people when they hear this, they say, ah, Prabhu, this life, that's all Prabhu. I cannot do more than that. 
believe me, that much only. No, no, no. One should not be so foolish to gamble away thinking that, uh, let me wait for the next life. Why? Why be a fool? Take seriously in this life itself. Why postpone your Krishna conscious? One should try to fulfill the mission of Krishna conscious in this life. So we should never postpone our Krishna conscious. Be very serious. Chant Hare Krishna. If we know today or tomorrow, this is the point of life that I should come. Then come to it. Be a little serious. Be a little stubborn. Be a little, you know, determined. Practice bhakti. Take up spiritual life. Accept a guru. And follow nicely. Understand nicely. And try to develop actual loving sentiments with understanding of Krishna. Krishna promises us that one who becomes his devotee will come to him without fail. Man mana bhava madbakto madhya ji maam namaskuru. Maam ivaishyasi satyam te prati jane priyo sime. Always think of me, become my devotee, worship me and offer your homage unto me. The result is that you will come to me without fail. I promise you this because you are my very dear friend. Krishna says to Arjuna. When we think of coming to Krishna, we should not think that we'll be standing before a void or an impersonal bright light. Krishna, God, is a person just as we are persons. Materially, we can understand that our father is a person and that his father is also a person and that his father's father is a person and so on back to the Supreme Father who must also be a person, Supreme Person. This is not very difficult to understand and it is noteworthy that God is called the Supreme Father. Not only in the Vedas, but in the Bible, Quran and other scriptures. They call him the Supreme Father. The Vedanta Sutra also confirms the absolute truth is the original father from which everything has taken birth or emanated. This is confirmed in the Vedas. Nityo nityanam chetanas chetana nam eko bahunam yo viradati kaman. The Lord is the Supreme Eternal amongst all Eternals. The supreme living entity amongst all living entities, he is, the main, he is maintaining all others. The desires and life symptoms displayed by all living entities are simply reflections of the desires and life symptoms of the Supreme Father. Whatever we see in this world is coming from him. We see personalities, we see life, we see nature, we see character because they are all there in him. In other words, our desires are born because he has desires. Because we are part and parcel of God, we have all instincts of God in minute quality. The sex play and sex life, which we see in this material world, is but the perverted reflection of the love that is found in the spiritual world. Love has become lust in this world. The world is material because God is forgotten him. But once he is remembered, the world immediately becomes spiritual. In other words, the spiritual world is that place where Krishna is forgotten. So why is there lust? Lust means forgetfulness of Krishna. When you remember Krishna, then immediately that transforms into love. That is also the definition of the spiritual world given in Vedic literatures. We must therefore plan our lives in such a way that it will not be possible for us to forget Krishna for a moment. In this way, by engaging in the service of Krishna, we will all therefore always live in Vaikuntha, or Vrindavan, the abode of Krishna. At present, due to our polluted consciousness, we are turning the world into a materialistic and hellish place. And because we are ignorant of our constitutional position, we have created innumerable problems. Just as in dreams, we create so many problems. But in actuality, there are no problems. I may dream that I am in a great storm, or that I am being pursued, someone is chasing after me, or that someone is taking away my money. Or that I'm being devoured by a tiger. But actually all these things are just creations of the mind. Asango yayam purusho iti shruti. The Vedas say that the purusha, the atma, the soul, has no connection with all, with all its dream-like material activities. All this material life that we're living, our designations, this body, the family, the relationship, the country, the culture, it is all ultimately a dream-like state. Therefore, we must engage in Krishna conscious process to awaken from this dreaming condition. The real relationship we have is with Krishna. The real nature we have is a devotee of Krishna. Everything else is just a temporary manifestation. We have nothing to do with this world actually. Problem is we take it too seriously and then we get stressed out. 
above all the fruity laborers, speculators, mystic yogis are the bhaktas or devotees of Krishna. A bhakta can be perfectly peaceful, whereas the others cannot because everyone but the bhakta who has pure love has desire. We have seen this verse. Bhukti, mukti, siddhi, kami, sakale ashan, Krishna bhakta, ata eva shan. Right? Krishna bhakta, niskama, ata eva shan. A Shuddha Bhakta is desireless because he is simply happy serving Krishna. He does not know or even care whether Krishna is God or not. He just wants to love Krishna. Nor is he concerned with the fact that Krishna is omnipotent or that he is all-pervasive. In Vrindavan, the cowherd boys and the gopis did not know whether Krishna was God or not. But they simply loved him. This unconditional love. Of course, first, we have to know Krishna is God. And practice and come to the point of loving him. When we love him, then we don't care whether he is God or not. Although they were not Vedantists, expert in Vedic Shastras, yogis or karmis, they were happy because they were simple village girls and boys who wanted to see Krishna. This is a very highly elevated position called Swarupe Sarvopadi Vinir Muktam Tat Paratvena Nirmalam, or the stage of purity in which one is liberated from all material designations. Although the yogis and jnanis are trying to understand Lord, they are not aware of their illusionary condition. Maya Sukaya Bharamut Vahato Vimudhan. We saw this in the earlier readings, Balad Maharaj prayers. They are fools because they are working hard for illusionary purposes. There is no question of peace for them. The jnanis, the speculators wanting to get relief from the hard work of this material world reject this material world. Brahma Satyam Jagat Nitya. They reject this world. Their position is a little higher from that of the Karmis because the Karmis have taken to this material world as everything. Like we mentioned in the earlier recording, Karmis want to romanticize this world. Jnanis want to demonize this world. Devotees will know how to utilize this world because there is the energy of the Lord. They say here we shall be happy. And their dharma or religion consists of trying to make a peaceful atmosphere within this material world. The fools do not know that this has been tried for millions of years, but has never happened and will never happen. The world will never be a peaceful place because it's not the nature of this world to be peaceful. Uh, His Holiness Jayadita Swami Maharaj told, this material world is like a toilet. No matter how much times you clean it, it will stink. Right? Because we are not meant to be in this material world. How can peace in the material world be possible when Krishna, the creator himself, says that this world, this place is meant for trouble and miseries? From the highest planet in this material world down to the lowest, all are places of misery. It's just say, wherein repeated birth and death take place. Dukkalayam ashashvatam. Not only is this world full of suffering, but it's also temporary. One cannot simply agree to go ahead to suffering the threefold miseries and stay here. Even that will not be allowed. In this world, he will not only be punished while staying here, but he will also be kicked out at the end. It's like a prisoner saying that, let me just remain in prison for the rest of my life. The prison committee and the national is always trying to how to get the prisoners out of prison. Right? Good behavior, this, that, this, then take them out. Prisoners say, no, 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 let me stay here. I want to remain here. So foolish. One may accumulate a large bank balance or an expense, expensive home, a wife, child, with so many amenities, and he may think, oh, wow, I am living very peacefully. But at any day, he may be told, please get out. Why? He will ask. It is my house. And it is paid for. I have money and a job and responsibilities. Why should I get out? Just get out. Don't talk. Get out. On that day, a man sees God. Oh, I did not believe in God, he may think. But now here is God, finishing off everything. Thus it is said that the demoniac recognized Krishna as death. For it is at that time that he takes away everything from them. Why do we want to see God as death? When the demon Hiranyakashipu saw Krishna, he saw him as death personified. But the devotee, Prahlad, saw him in his personal form as his beloved Lord. Those who challenge God will see him in his ghastly aspect, but those who are devoted to him will see him in his personal form. Another beautiful line. 
someone does not believe in God, at the end of life, you'll be forced to believe in God when you see him as cruel death. Right? Better just learn to love him now itself. In any case, everyone will ultimately see God. A person who is honest can always see Krishna everywhere. Krishna says, try to understand me, try to see me everywhere. By way of facilitating this method, the Lord says, Rasoham apsu kaunteya, I'm the taste in water. You want to experience me? I'm the taste in water. Drink water, that nourishment, that satisfaction, that soothing feeling, that is Krishna. When we are thirsty and we need a glass of water, we can drink it and feel happy. Understanding the power to quench our thirst is Krishna. Similarly, as soon as there is sunrise or moonshine, we can see Krishna. For he says, Prabhasmi sasi surya ho. I am the sun and the moon. At a further stage, we can see Krishna as the life force within everything. As he indicates in Bhagavad Gita. Punyaganda pritev. Punyaganda pritevyam cha tejas chasmi vibhavaso. Jivanam sarvabhute su tapas chasmi tapas visu. I am the original fragrance of the earth. Earth has a beautiful fragrance, especially when it rains, just raining, that smell of the earth, Punyaganda. And I am the light in fire, I am the life that all that lives and I am the penance of all aesthetics. Once we understand that all things are dependent upon Krishna for their existence, there is no possibility of his ever becoming lost to us. In Bhagavad Gita, the Lord indicates that all things abide in him, both in their beginning and in their end, also in their interim state. Everything is depending on Krishna. Of all that is material and all that is spiritual in this world, know for certain that I am both its origin and dissolution. O conqueror of wealth, Arjuna, there is no truth superior to me. Everything rests upon me as pearls are strung on a thread. Krishna is very easily visible, but he is only visible to those who are devoted to him. For those who are envious, foolish, unintelligent, he obscures himself with the veil of Maya. Now someone may think that, no, 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 I am not envious of Krishna. I am not fool. I am not intelligent. But if one does not take up to bhakti, one does not become a devotee, that means one is envious. Then why don't you become a devotee? Right? One is foolish. One is unintelligent. Naham prakasha sarvasya yoga maya samavrata mudo yam nabi janati loko maam ajam avyayam I am never manifest to the foolish and the unintelligent. For them I am covered by my etern eternal creative potency maya. So therefore many people they cannot understand Krishna. Why? Because they are foolish. They don't want to understand Krishna. Krishna said, okay fine. Covered. Naham prakasha sarvasya I will not be, you will not be able to see me. Thus the deluded world knows me not who am unborn and infallible. This eternal creative potency of yoga maya which obscures Krishna to the unintelligent is dissolved by love. This is the verdict of Brahma Sandhita. If you want to overcome this veil of maya, we have to develop love. Pre manjana churita bhakti vilochane na santa sadaiva kridaye subiloka yanti one who has developed love for Krishna can see him within his heart 24 hours a day. Those who are thus see Krishna are not anxious because they know that they are going at death. They know where they are going at death. One who has taken the gift of Krishna conscious knows that he will not have to return to this material world to take another body, but that he will go to Krishna. It is not possible to go to Krishna unless one attains a body like Krishna's, a Satchit Ananda Vigraha body, a body full of eternity, knowledge and bliss. One cannot enter into fire and not perish unless he himself becomes fire. You put fire into fire, the fire will not die. You put anything else into fire, it will burn and die. Similarly, one cannot enter into the spiritual realm in a body that is not spiritual. In a spiritual body, one can dance with Krishna in the rasa dance like the gopis and the cowherd boys. This is not an ordinary dance, but the dance of eternity in the association of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Only those who have become purified in their love for Krishna can participate in it. One, therefore, should not take this process of Krishna consciousness as something cheap, but as a matchless gift. 
bestowed upon suffering humanity by the Lord himself. Simply by engaging in this process, all the anxieties and fears of one's life, which in actuality revolve about the fear of death, is allayed, right? is overcome, is stopped. So like this, we can see we completed this beautiful book, The Matchless Gift, Krishna Consciousness. How so clear, how so important, eternal is bhakti. And we should, uh, you know, take all advantages to practice it, read it. And the practice begins, like Prabhupada says, the most easiest is Shravanam, Kirtanam, especially chanting. So let us chant this Hare Krishna Mahamantra as much as we can, as long as we can, whenever we can. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Rama Hare Hare. Jai Shla Prabhupada Ki.